<laughs> okay, yesterday uh, we performed at the mall, and that was the only thing that we did based on audience vote and audience participation. And we, we got lots of votes actually, and um, so that's exciting, and I think we have a pretty good audience for the, for the mall, because I've performed at the mall before with just a few people, and so it was, it was a nice audience. So second place um, yesterday, and this is her second second place, and so she's on a roll, um, so one time I hope to announce her first, but second place is Allison Gray. And then first place is Mr. Eric Warrens. And so um, this is your second first place. So congratulations. You have $200 um, in your bank waiting for you to collect if you are the winner of this competition. We're here at the Presidential Archives and Leadership Library. Um, this was inspired, unfortunately, by the assassination of President Kennedy back in 1963. So it's about to celebrate its 50th anniversary. Um, the Presidential Archives is a unique museum in the United States as it's the only uh, museum dedicated to the presidency. So you'll have, say, like Clint's library is all dedicated to Clint. Well, this one's dedicated to all um, different presidents. So this will be the scene of the mini challenge. Um, I really uh, enjoy the library. And this is uh, a nice gem for us. So I'm excited that we're here today. Um, so let's start with the excerpts of our speeches, and we're going to start with Eric. Good morning, fellow American. I am reading to you today the Abraham Lincoln Second Inaugural Address. March 14, 1865, Washington, D.C. Fondly we do hope, frivolously we do pray, that this mighty scourge of war speedily pass away. Yet if God that yet wills it continue until the wealth piled by the bondsmen 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the last shall be paid by another drawn by the sword. As we said 3,000 years ago, so still must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and altogether righteous. With malice towards one, with clarity, charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us the right to see right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for whom, him who shall born the battle for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just lasting peace among ourselves and all nations. Hello, my name is Eric Juarez, and I'm going to be doing a speech about Abraham Lincoln on the Gettysburg Address, which was on November 19, 1863. It took place in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Four scores and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who, are, who here gave their lives that the nation might live. 
it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a large sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot concentrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled healed, have consecrated it far above our power to add or detract. The road would little note for long remember. What we say here, but it cannot, they can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work, which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that farm from which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead should not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not permit for the earth. It is easy enough to say that man will endure, because he is immortal. That when the last ding-dong of doom has clanged and faded from that last worthless rock, hanging tideless in the last red and dying evening, that even then there will be still one more sound, that of his puny, inexhaustible voice, still talking. I refuse to accept this. I believe that man will not merely endure. He will prevail. He is immortal. Not because he alone among creatures has an inexhaustible voice, but because he has a soul a spirit capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance. The poets, the writer's duty is to write about these things. It is his privilege to help man endure by lifting his heart, by reminding him of the courage and honor and hope and pride and compassion and pity and sacrifice, which have been the glory of his past. The poet's voice need not merely be the record of man. It can be one of the props, the pillars to help him endure and prevail. Franklin Della Roosevelt, first inaugural dress, March 4th, 1933 in Washington, D.C. I am certain that my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and decision which the president's situation of our, na er, of our nation impels. This is permanently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and bold. Nor need we shrink from honesty facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive, and will prosper. So, first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and vigor has met with the understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. I am convinced that you will again give that support to leadership in these critical days. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its vicious racists and its governor having his lips dripping with the words 
of interposition and nullification. One day, right here down in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as brothers and sisters. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain made low. The rough places made plain. The crooked places made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the South with. This is the faith that will be able to hew out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together Pray together, struggle together, go to jail together, stand up for freedom together, knowing that one day we will be free. This will be the day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, for thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, Land of the pilgrim's pride from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. Frederick Douglass. What to the slave is the 4th of July? July 5th, 1852, Rochester, New York. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not in common. The blessings and the rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, Independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice. I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters to the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems where inhumane mockery and sacrilegious irony did you mean citizens to mock me by asking me to speak to you today? That a man who is to lead a clean and honorable life must inevitably suffer if his speech likewise is not clean and honorable. Every man here knows the temptations that beset all of us in this world. At times any man will slip. I do not expect perfection, but I do expect genuine and sincere effort towards being decent and cleanly in thought, in a word and in deed. As I said at the outset, I hail the work of this society as typifying one of those sources which tend to be, which tend to the betterment and uplifting of our social system. Our whole effort should be towards securing a combination of the strong qualities with those qualities which turn virtues. I expect you to be strong. I would not respect you if you were not. I do not want to see Christianity professed only by the weaklings. I want to see a moving spirit among men of strength. I do not expect you to lose one particle of your strength or courage by being decent. On the contrary, I should hope to see each man who is a member of this society from his membership in it to become all the fitter to do the rough work of the world, all the fitter to work in time of peace, and if, 
which may heaven forfend, war should come, all the fitter to fight in time of war. I desire to see in this country the decent man strong and the strong man decent. And until we get that combination in pretty good shape, we are not going to be by any means as successful as we should be. Ronald Reagan, Remarks of the Brandenburg Gate, June 12, 1987, Brandenburg Gate, Berlin. Behind me, send the walled in the circles of free sectors of this city, part of the vast system of barriers. I'm sorry. Keep going. Part of the vast system of barriers that divide an entire continent of Europe. From the Baltic South, those barriers cut across Germany in a gash of barbed wires, concrete, dog runs, and guard towers. Farther south, there may be no visible, no obvious wall, but there still remains armed guards and checkpoints all the same. Still a restriction on the right to travel. Still an instrument to impose upon the ordinary men and women the will of a totalitarian state. Yet, it is here in Berlin that the wall emerges most clearly. Here, cutting across your city, where the news photo and television have imprinted a brutal division of a continent upon the mind of the world. Standing before Brandenburg Gate, every man is a German divided from his fellow men. Every Berliner forced to look upon the scar. We welcome change and openness, for we believe that freedom and security go together. That the advance of human liberty, the advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause for world peace. There was one sign that the Soviets could make that would be unmistakable. That would, be, that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Security Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. After this challenge was over, it was suggested by myself that we concentrate more on the workshop and less on the competition. This left some of the contestants really fuming, as we will see in future episodes. So after much debate and consideration, it was decided that we would select somebody at that point and send them home. This drama will play out among the other judges, between the other contestants, between people who are sent home and people who are staying. After it was narrowed down, a number of contestants were asked to say why they should stay in the contest. And once that was decided, our next contestant was sent home. All right. Okay. If I call your name, you were safe. You're continuing on in this competition. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't call anybody safe. Take um, so if you are safe, if you can make yourself over to the lobby. So the first name I'm going to call is Joe. Oh, oh, oh. oh I'm sorry. Can we clap? I'm going to clap for everything. No, no. Well, I'll, I'll be the first one to start clapping. OK. The second name I'm going to call is Stephanie. Make your number two round. I get the number two round. OK. <laughs> I'm going to do this. <laughs> That's very nice of you. <laughs> And the next name I'm going to call is Eric. Okay, the remaining five of you, for one reason or another, by one judge, has been put on the Chowder Blog to get the next two people eliminated. So this is your one and only chance to look into the camera, to look at the judges, and say why you should continue on this competition. So we'll start with Trika, and then we'll end with Rachel. So if you can stand up and come here. Well, uh, this is why a I fight for your life moment. Okay. And go. 
Go. I feel like I should stay because I've been winning a lot of the challenges. Um, I've been getting good critiques. And yeah, that's all. Have a seat. Allison. I feel like I should stay because I've been on time to everything and I feel like I've been doing what I've been asked to do for every competition. Okay. Zoe. I feel like I should stay because I will be damned if I get kicked out of everything that I've done. I have been on time for pretty much everything. I've been putting all of my hardest work into everything that I do. I mess up sometimes, but everybody does. And I think eliminating me would just, it's just not a good decision. I want to learn from this experience. I, I want to be here. This is huge for me. I'm 18. I'm about to go off to college. This is what I want to do for a living. Okay. I would like to stay because I'm ready to stop holding back and I would like to win. I want to win. Rachel. Well, I want to stay because I have the commitment, I have the determination, I have the willingness to learn. Uh, I'm learning so much already. I'm excited. I'm, I have the tenacity to keep going and I want to be here. Um, okay, so um, we made a decision on the next person who's going to lead the contest. Um, but I'm going to say the, the strong points and the weak points on the arguments that I'm hearing. Okay. Um, Allison, your strong point is that you take direction well um, and that you're really, really trying. The weak points are this is the last day, and if this was a long workshop to teach acting, um, we would pick you first um, to be in the workshop, but right now it's almost over, and so I um, hear that at this point, this might be the most that you can learn out of this experience. Um, your strong point is that you're very committed um, uh, to the process and that you're a good actress. Um, your weak points are that you um, tend to take over groups, um, and that, that you're over committed, making you not do well on your challenges. Your strong points are that you're helping everyone, and everyone appreciates you being in the process. Your weak points are you're helping, you're playing teacher mode, and it's instead of actually acting, um, this you know, helps people so much to your own detriment. Um, your strong points are your commitment and, and your singing, um, but certain people feel that you're holding back and that maybe you've gone as far as that you can go um, because of the depth of emotion, that there's no more emotional depth um, coming from you. And so maybe at this point would be a good time to go because um, wouldn't see anything else further from you in the comedy challenge. So those are your strengths and your weaknesses at, at this point that we continue um, to debate on. And so... Um, and unfortunately, in the end, the person sent home next was Allison Gray, a terrific singer and potential actress. But unfortunately, it was her time to go. With only seven contestants remaining and three more episodes to go, two contestants will be sent home next week. So stay tuned for more episodes of the Dessa Acting Workshop and Competition.